School, University of Oxford, and if you would like to see the more details about her, you may wish to refer the website, please. I feel I should get you all to stand up and stretch or something because you've been sitting there so patiently. We've worked so hard already. You must be exhausted. What a great start for me. Eh? Okay, so my presentation is called Why Do Strategic Plans Fail? Um, well, to be honest, that's quite a presumptuous title. Uh, it's also a bit of a provocative title. And um, by way of apology for being both of those things, um, I offer the view that I see myself these days at my age as being what I like to call the reflective end of my career. And so more and more often now I find that what I'm doing is I'm stepping back and kind of just thinking about what I've done in the past, the things that I think I've done well, but also trying to think about the things that I haven't done so well. And today is a way of sharing some of the latter of that by way of seeing whether there's some lessons that we can all learn. But although I start by saying, why do strategic plans fail? In fact, what I'm trying to do is get to the second part, right? To see if we can make some, some um, positive recommendations. And I'll be interested in to hear what you have to say about what you do and to have some, what in Australia we will call robust discussion, which uh, I've noticed in the last day and a half you guys are really, really good at doing as well. You're as good as the Australians. You go into robust discussion, which I think is very healthy. So having a look at um, what I mean by strategic plans, if we have a look at a, de a definition of strategic planning, and I've just taken that from any online dictionary, a process in which a company's executives decide what they want to achieve and the best actions and use of resources for achieving this. Okay. And the words that jump out at me in that definition are decide, the actions, and the resources. Yeah. To put a bit more focus on that, it seems to me the strategic planning, therefore, as a process, should at least involve some sort of decision about what an organisation wants to do and where it wants to go and how it, it intends to get there. And that that at the very beginning should at least involve the selection of some options to the exclusion of some others. In other words, we make a decision about what we want to do as opposed to what we may not want to do. We would hope that within that there would also be some sort of plan of action that's going to actually make that be realised. Yeah? And that there should be some reference to the resources that are going to be required to achieve them. And by resources, they could be anything. They could be good infrastructure, staffing resources, budgetary resources, time, the whole lot of it, yeah? Lack of disruption and so on. But when I look at strategic plans or library strategic plans, do a search on Google for strategic plans, uh, which I've been doing for the last couple of weeks. You'll find that they generally read as this image looks. Vast, vast panoramic views of an entire universe. It's absolutely endless. They contain everything that could possibly be contained within them. Right? But rarely, if you look at them, are they selective in their content. They include everything. And you know how that happens. If any of you have any of you been involved recently in a meeting where strategic planning has taken place, can you put your hands up? Not too many of you. Well, you've been very fortunate. <laughs> what generally happens is you get a group of people, they usually see a lot of people, and they say, you know what, we need to formulate a strategic plan. What should be in it? And the first person will say, well, it's got to be about collections. That's what libraries are about, right? Oh, yes, we've got to put collections in there. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. And then somebody says, but really, we're about customer service, aren't we? Of course we are. Let's put in customer service. And then someone says, but what about preservation and... and you know, cultural preservation and, and so on. Oh, we've got to put that in. And digitisation. We can't leave digitisation out. That goes in. And then somebody says, but what about these days we're looking at all sorts of other things, yeah? Oh, yes, that's got to go in. And by the end of the day, you've got a huge shop list and everything. And then it cascades down to lower level staff for the review and they say, oh, but you've left out this that I do. Oh, well, let's put that in, right? So they're never selective. They include absolutely everything. The second thing you'll notice is they never actually specify any individual actions. Right? 
or very rarely. Sometimes people have implementations that go inside them. But it's amazing when you look at implementation plans, they don't actually differ all that much from the strategic plan. And the other thing is they hardly ever, ever specify the resources that are going to be required to get from A to Z. Yeah? A library, so library strategic plans tend to look like this. And this is in reference to how they are written. So here are just some examples, which I've taken from a library very close to me. And as this is going to be filmed and end up somewhere, I'm not going to mention the name. But it's a, it's a library with which I have a very close and intimate relationship. Right? So provided well-informed staff, able to help readers and other users receive the best possible service. Now, I was instrumental in getting all this written. So this is a criticism of me as much as anybody else. I don't want to be sounding like I'm criticising the Bodleian staff. Oh, just left that out. Uh, I was instrumental in formulating this strategy or helping to, to write it, okay? And then you'll see some other. Ensure our spaces meet our readers' requirements. Now, I don't know if you were noticing the way that this is couched. But you'll notice that in terms of how these are written, they are completely incontestable, right? I mean, you could never say, let's not provide spaces that meet our users' requirements, or let's provide spaces that don't meet our students' requirements, yeah? Let's not provide a robust infrastructure that supports innovative services. It couldn't be done. They're all in there, right? Understand the needs of readers and other users through consultation and analysis of data and feedback. Collaborate with academics. This is a very good one. In fact, I think I, I, I put that one in and said we must collaborate. And so this is how it's come in. It's actually a very elegant, very well written strategic plan. This is only a small part of it, but you can read a whole lot on the internet. Now that's all very well and good. We do produce very good strategic plans, I have to say. If you read them, they are wonderful, wonderful documents. And they're wonderful documents because I think as professional librarians, we take actually a lot of pride in doing this sort of thing. And I think it's actually part of our DNA to write documents that we can put forward and people can say, these are great ideals by which professional librarians are proud to stand, right? And that we own and that we like to be identified by. So we take a lot of care when we write these strategic plans. And they're well written, they're well structured, and they make us all very proud. But in actual fact, do they provide strategic direction? Well, for a strategic plan to provide strategic direction, it has to do a number of things. It has to be relevant. It has to be realistic. And it has to be containing of things which are achievable within a specified period of time. I think we can say they're always relevant. Well, they have to be relevant because they contain absolutely everything that you could possibly think of doing within a lifetime or 10, right? So they're always going to be relevant. There's no, there's no problem there. Uh, are they realistic? Well, in fact, we don't even uh, stop and think, are they actually measurable? And how would they be measurable, right? We write them and they're fine, but they just stand there like, very beautiful ideals. The third one, I was actually going to put a cross on that, but I thought maybe that was too unkind, so instead I've given it two question marks. Are they achievable within a specified time frame? And what time frame is a reasonable time frame? Who sets that? Who determines what's a reasonable time frame? And who sets about trying to work out whether it's going to be achievable? And who actually sets out the indicators that will say whether in fact it was achievable to the extent that it should have been achievable within the time frame that was specified. So in actual fact, a lot of our strategic plans, if you read them, are really acts of faith. And the difficulty can be that, first of all, the goals are too ambitious or they're an unreasonable scale relative to the available resources. Now, this is not always the case, but these are some of the potential dangers of the sort of strategic plans that we have. And they, the goals are unaligned with skills and roles. Now, this is a real, real big concern, and it's one that is being felt, I think, through a lot of institutions now, particularly as, as some of the early, one of the earlier speakers said today, libraries are becoming much, much more complex operations. 
and we're having to deal with a much bigger variety of areas of responsibility. And a lot of people are starting to worry about whether or not we have the right skills to deliver on all these new areas that are coming up. Open access, uh, digitization, uh, e-management of, of e-contracts, for example, as somebody was saying, and a whole lot of other roles. I don't even have to tell you what they are. So aligning staff skills can be a real problem. And then the third one is the loss of vital resources. We can have great big plans, but then you only have to lose a couple of key staff, and then you're back to the drawing board. Or the infrastructure changes, or the dean changes, or the head of your library changes. All sorts of things can happen, and there's this disruption to your plan. That is not to say that strategic plans do not actually work as artefacts. So I just want to just um, emphasise that again. And, but as, a, as an artefact, I think they work quite well. And what I mean by an artefact is a statement that you can put out there and in a sense, this is I think what we're doing, is that we say these are statements that show that we get it. We get what we're supposed to be about. Right. Our strategic plans embody those sorts of things which says to the organisation, we're aligned with you in terms of our respect for quality and our respect for the things that we should be trying to achieve and they are noble and they justify our remit to be there and they give us the entitlement to be supported by the people who hold the purse strings. The problem with Strategic plans as artefacts, however, is that artefacts tend to get shelved on a shelf uh, with a label called done and dusted. And they tend to sit there largely undisturbed for quite some time until something happens. So it could be the dean suddenly says, um, we'd like to know some of the things that you've done that sort of, you know, justify what the library's role is. And you quickly go and you get a message from somebody up above saying, uh, could you look at the strategic plan and give some examples of what you've done that show that you've promoted the strategic plan? And you're madly looking around for things. You say, oh, what did we do last year? Oh, we did this. Yep, that's in line with our strategic plan. Let's put that forward. And you're scrambling around looking for things that say, yeah, we have done something to the strategic plan. The bigger problem, however, I see it, is that you can be lulled into a sense of complacency thinking that you've done the job, right? Um, however, what you haven't done is produced an alternate document that is actually going to help you reach some of the goals that you should be reaching in terms of service improvements. In other words, you can have a mission statement, but you need something else that will take you somewhere where you can actually chart, manage, control, determine the, the incremental steps that are going to help you get service improvements across your whole organisation that your users can actually experience and say, I can see what they're doing and I can see how they, what they've done has actually made it better for me as a library user or as an information user. So this is one of the sort of the lurking dangers of strategic plans, the fact that people think that they've, they've done it and they can just go on business as usual. So what are some of the options instead? Well, um, just better watch the time. Somebody can give me a, a nod when I'm talking too, too much. So um, I've spoken about the, all the areas that I've made, right? And I can see that a lot of you are really working at the very practical level to uh, develop resources and services for your people. So I'm really talking from the point of view of, of what I've done and the sort of dangers that I see that occur in there. And it seems to me that the way forward that I now see is what I like to call democratisation of the strategic plan process. Now, for whenever you say strategic planning, uh, the tendency is for people to see that as something that belongs to very senior staff. Strategic planning belongs to the managers, right? And even when people cascade the strategic planning process down to get feedback from people and to get input from the lower level staff, it's still seen very much as a managerial role, right? I'm not suggesting that there is anything wrong with that because I do believe the managers are responsible ultimately for what the library does, right? But what I'm talking about is a democratisation of the process so that you can move away from what I call the voices in the room syndrome, and I've already made a bit of a reference to that. 
So what I mean by voices in the room syndrome is what typically happens when strategic plan type things are determined. So you get a bunch of people in the room, it's on the agenda. Strategic plan on an agenda never has adrenaline pumping urgency about it, right? It's just something people put there because they feel it has to be done if they haven't got one or needs to be refreshed because it hasn't been refreshed for a number of years. But it's not up there that gets the enthusiasm and the blood boiling like um, somebody wants to change the library hours or somebody wants to change your budget structure or somebody wants to take away half your stuff or half your space. It doesn't have that adrenaline. But the voices in the room, whatever happens is the dynamics about the actual individuals who happen to be there who give the flavour and the sound to the strategic plan that you're going to have, right? And to move away from that requires what I would call a democratisation of the, of the whole process, and that is moving away from the voices in the room. And that means involves identification of service improvement goals across the whole organisation, but not to do that on its own, never to do that on its own, but rather to do it at the same time as you identify the skills, needs and gaps that exist in the organisation so that you can always consider the two absolutely together. And this is one of the things that I think I have been really, really good at doing badly. Uh, I'm the sort of person who gets very bored when there's nothing new to do. And I will walk in on my staff and say, why don't we do this on board? Let's do this. This will be fun. This will be exciting. And then I stop and think, who's going to do it? And do they actually have the skills to deliver on it? I've been very fortunate my staff have delivered on things. But it ought to be an automatic part of the process that we never talk about tasks without actually talking about the skills required. The reverse of that, and here I might be a bit controversial as well, uh, I've spent a lifetime agreeing to people going on all sorts of skills programs. And that's because we encourage that. At the Bodmin Library, we have what's called an annual review process. We're not allowed to call them performance reviews. That's a real no-no. It's an annual review, right? And as part of that process, we ask people to volunteer the sort of training that they think they would like to do, that they feel they should do. And whenever I say to people, so what are we going to put in this box of training you want to do? They start looking blank, right? And they say things like, well, um, I'm not really good at social media. I wouldn't mind doing a course on social media. And I say, that's a good idea. Let's put that in. And that goes to HR and they go to social training. Or people come forward and they say, there's a program on coding. I always wanted to know how to do coding. And I say, OK, let's, let's send you off to coding. That's a really good skill to have, right? I think that is a terrible mistake. I, and, and I'll tell you why I think it's a terrible mistake. It's because too often people are sent on courses to learn to do things which they are then not going to apply immediately and in an effective and real way. If you do that too often, in my view, what happens is that people start feeling actually less in power than they did at the beginning. Because they go off to all these courses, they come back, they don't use them, three months later they've forgotten all about it, they can't remember how to do it. Right? And then after a while they say, well, you know, I've done a course on this, I've done, I've done a course on Project Light, I did that last year, can't remember anything about it, never had to use it. Uh, I've done a course on HTML, haven't done anything, forgotten how to use it. And in, and in fact, it's a very disempowering thing to do. On the other hand, if you say to someone, um, we've determined that we're going to do this new way of creating a guide, we're going to have some more animation, it's too static. We need some more animation in there because this generation of users wants you know, something a little bit more lively, a bit more related to the things they use but somebody needs to learn animation. So you send, say to somebody, is that something that you're interested in? You send them off and they say, well, I don't know how to do it. So, okay, we'll send you off to a course. And if they go and do that course and they come back and they apply it, not only is it more effective in terms of what you can achieve, but it's a much more effective way of upskilling people. Yeah? So I think we need to identify skills gaps, but only in relation to the sorts of things that we want actually people to apply those skills for. So they're the two things that I think are absolutely critical. But in particular, I think what we need to do is that we then need to go one step further. And that is 
to democratise the process by which we allow the staff to do the joining of the dots between the goals and between the skills needed. Now, um, we've had some wonderful examples given in the day and a half uh, up to now of how you guys and everybody in Harvard and, and here and our Neil team and others um, engender a community team sort of spirit among the staff and this is absolutely wonderful. Um, I think we actually need to go a step further and to be able to identify the skills that people have and often we will not know the skills that people have. We know the people but we don't really know the skills they have and we also don't know the skills that they're able to have. And staff themselves, if you ask them, what skills do you think you're going to need in the next 12 months? Often, you know, they're working off a blank canvas. We don't give them a whole range. We don't say, here is a listing of all the possible skills that can be used in any operation in the library. Have a look at those. Have a think about some of those skills and see whether they're skills that you think you could incorporate, that you think you have a natural affinity with, that we could actually send you off and be skilled at. Right? So we don't do that. Instead, we ask them to come up with a context of absolutely nothing and think, mm, I'd like to be able to do that. The other thing that we don't do is we don't let them know about all the activities that other people do. Now, uh, I know that in small teams, it's easy for people to know what others are doing, but only in a general way. What can happen in small libraries is that people become even more um, secretive almost. Uh, they have a stronger ownership about their particular work area. So they like the way they do it. And they'll say, well, I do book acquisition. And if you said, well, can you show me how you do it? And I say, why do you want to know? That's not your job, that's my job, right? You're treading in my territory here, yeah? That often happens. In big organisations, it's a slightly different version of that. I have been to meetings where, for example, people are leaving and there's a big group of people and the Bodleian's a huge, huge monolithic organisation. And people who know each other by face, will, you know, they'll have a, a drink or two and then they'll say, oh, not I say, they have a drink or two, and they say, uh, so what do you do exactly, right? They don't know what other people are doing. Unless people understand with a great deal of detail, that is, unless we can democratise the information and give people that information, they cannot then relate what they do and how that could be improved by what other people do in the fine detail. So I would like to see a universe where people can say, when I'm evaluating my work, not my performance, but my work and what I do, I can think, for example, I, man I manage a budget, oh, I manage two budgets in my library, and I would like to be able to say, well, it's not what I want to do that's better, it's what I'd like the finance people to do better, to produce different types of reports and these types of reports that would actually make it easier for me to understand my budget, right? Similarly, if people could have a democratisation of the information, they could, in the same way, then be more proactive and have more ownership about indicating those service areas across the whole organisation that's going to impact on them but also impact on the service delivery across the board because we're very interconnected in what we do and different areas impact on different areas. So having people join the dots and be able to relate what they do with what other people do, relate the skills they have, see the skills that other people have, see how they can make improvements and it's very important to talk to the lower level staff about the service improvements because it's only the people on the ground who know that the users don't like one particular printer but they like another type of printer. It's only the people on the ground who know that people seem to all stream in at 12 o'clock and they're very noisy, right? The people at the scene here like me who have an office, it's generally a bad indicator if you've got an office Generally, you don't know what's going on on the ground. Yeah? You know your staff, you have a general idea, but you, know, you don't know it with the same kind of fine nuance that your staff know. But your staff have to realise and own the, uh, the process, the strategic planning process of being able to identify those incremental service improvements that can be made across the, the whole organisation. So getting people to um, have ownership of the, uh, the, the joining of the dots between tasks and skills, I think is going to be extremely important. 
So who does what and how, and how, who can do what and how? And then to be thinking of themselves within the context of both of those particular factors. How am I going for time? You got 10 minutes. 10 minutes? I'm going, to leave, I'm going to leave time for questions, obviously. So, in addition to, so in my conclusion, I think it's important that we have strategic plans, but let's not call them strategic plans. Let's call them something else. Let's uh, call them mission me. statements. You can uh, give five to seven minutes for discussion also. Beautiful. So, in okay. that case, you will have three to four minutes. Only. Three to four minutes. I'm going to go for taking my time to rushing through. So, in conclusion, I think, I think strategic plans, if they're not called strategic plans, are very fine things, and I think they're very important to have. And they set the tone, and I was very interested to hear from Deborah that she actually has it in front of her staff so that they can keep it there and they don't forget it. They don't become an artifact on a, on a dusty shelf. But in addition to the, the mission, I think that more and more uh, these days, it is going to be important that we actually have a methodology that we can employ that mops up ideas from people about small incremental improvements that can be made across the whole organisation, not just in their areas, but a whole, across the whole organisation. So to build a strategic plan from below, to deliver strategic improvements through achievable incremental steps, audit the skills needed for delivery of tasks and to stop talking about uh, projects or tasks without reference to the skills that are going to be required to deliver them, and align tasks with the skills and then review the task constantly. Uh, and here, just to, to sort of have towards the end another controversial statement, if I had my way all over again through my career, I would just refuse to do annual reviews of staff. I would only do reviews of actual projects. I think if we've employed the right staff and we nurture them and deliver them, I don't, think, I don't see why we keep on reviewing them on a yearly basis. I think we should review the performance of the activities that staff are engaged with from the point of view of what else could have been added to them in terms of skills, opportunities, context, environment that would help, help them do that a lot better. Right? And that's, they've got to own that information and they've got to recognise that information and offer it. So review tasks and not staff. Um, interestingly, uh, my husband and I, when we were going to the Sun Temple, uh, I was sitting in the car, an hour and a half drive, which is a great drive and a great, great sight. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, and every now and again, I sort of, you know, when I do this, I sort of go off and I think about ideas and the paper and so on. And it just happened, on the bridge came up this sign that says, it's not about ideas, it's about making ideas happen. And I thought, oh my God, someone's read my brain, someone's read my, pa my paper, <laughs> and it's produced this. It's not about ideas, it's about making ideas happen. So that in the end, while we hope we have the ideas, we put the skills together and then we have outcomes that we can keep evaluating as we move incrementally forward. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation. May I invite questions now? Oh, I was going to escape. <laughs> Chris, that was a wonderful uh, insight into this. And I really like review task and not the staff. I think that's a, that's a very good uh, human resource policy any organization can have. And when you said about uh, strategic plan initially, uh, do you mean to say that plan should not be generic? It should not be just a rhetoric. It should be probably broken down into actual realizable steps. No, I think, I think we need to be much clearer about what we're writing. So I think what passes for strategic plans, if you look at them on the internet, if you all go home tonight because you've got nothing better to do, <laughs> to search your library strategic plans and read them, they all read the same way. In fact, if you'd remove the name, yeah. you'd recognise that this is a university strategic plan, this is a public library strategic plan, this is a strategic plan of a small organisation, this is a strategic plan of a big organisation. You can almost guess which library it is, but you could do a template. You know, we don't all need to do this. They all embody the same ideals that as a library profession we are trying to promote, and, and, and you know, as today. 
so I, but I think having them there is really, it does serve, is, my view is that within our own organisations they do serve to act as a testament to the people who fund us and the people who support us, that as I said, that we kind of get it, we, we belong to the academic community because our missions, our goals, our ideals match those of the organisations. In an ideal world, if we did this, the organisation would be extremely well served. So I think those documents being there are very important. And there will be some sort of specification that makes it specific to the organisation, but generally they, they do tend to be kind of generic. But what I'm saying is that we tend to think that once we've done the strategic plan, we've, we've done, you know, it's done and dusted. And then on a daily basis, we have a very haphazard way, a very unstructured way of deciding what we're going to put our energies on. And the thing that I notice is that, you know, you have to make decisions about where you're going to put staff time, where you're going to put your time, where you're going to put your money, where you're going to put the, the expertise. What sort of ex additional expertise or skills you're going to bring in is very important. What are you going to skill your staff with? Depends on what decisions you're going to make about what you want to do. And we don't, it seems to me, we don't have a structured methodology that captures that information and then says, now let's get together and determine what, what it is that we're going to put as our high priorities, what skills are we going to need, who are we going to send off to do the skilling, uh, and how are we are going to then measure whether we're successful or not. We tend to sort of, re we tend to be reactive, which is good, but then we need to put some order around that. And we, we, we lack a methodology, we lack a toolkit that allows us to put that into a controlled process that everybody can see and know. Because the other extreme you don't want. You don't want to democratise the process and that everybody knock on the door saying, I've had an idea, you know, and a week later come and say, why didn't we do that idea that I, that I volunteered, right? They have to understand <coughs> that it has to be part of a process. But the democratisation of the process means that people have to be thinking in terms of, we can achieve this if we put the energy and the skill and we have this person can go off and be skilled at doing that. We can put it together. This is how long it's going to take. And then the, the, the strategic process, the real strategic process then comes into play to say, okay, this is how we're going to do it and these are the ones we're going to prioritise and these are the ones we're going to try and achieve over the next six months, 12 months or whatever. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, if they are here, you know, once this is over, let's go here. You can talk to them. Okay. Chris, uh, I had this is Anil here. Right? Yeah. So I had a uh, sort of uh, it's not a question, maybe a clarification. When we develop strategic plans, we ha we also have to look at the deliverables, right? Now, plan for the sake of plan doesn't make sense uh, if you don't have very clear deliverables for a library. Yep. Now, one of the confusions that most of us have is, what does a library deliver? Is it circulation? Is it referencing? Is it assisting research? There is no concrete, concrete measurable metric which says that at the end of the year, this is what a library delivers. Yep. So yep. I just wanted to know your perspective. Yep. On and I think this is a combination of having um, uh, what I call work tasks, for want of a, a better phrase, work tasks that are within, within the environment, within the, the, the geography of the mission statement, right? So they are within the overall goals of what the library should be about. But then you look at the, you look at individual tasks within that and say, well, this is the deliverable that I can do that contributes to that. And something that the, the, the staff may have said, you know, uh, there's a bottleneck around PCs, blah, blah, blah. And then you look at that and you say, okay, well, let's try and understand, let's try and untangle that. Let's try to un understand what is the cause of that. And then you find that, in fact, it's a space issue. You know, there's a congestion there because it's a space issue, or maybe people are trying to print at the wrong time, we've got a wrong printing system or whatever. And then you say, okay, increment, this is an incremental service improvement that we can make because it's, it is responding to a service need that you can see. And that marries to your mission statement that says you will try to make use of the library as efficient and trouble-free as possible. You know, you remove obstacles in the use of the library. That is, would be a great mission statement to have. Right? And you could say, well, that will fit in very well because we've observed a service need. 
we're going to look at what it will require. If it requires money, because we have to do something, we have to recognise it's going to require money, it's going to require but then you can structure that into a methodology where you're, you're able to pick these things up, but always think in terms of how this, what, what are the resources, the skills, the resources, and the other resources that are going to be there to deliver it. Um, Chris, I have a question. Who is the target group for the um, strategic plan? Is it your staff or is it your I, institution? I, I always think it's, it's, you know, it's people like the, the deans. It's, like, it's, it's the senior people who want to know. The senior people are never going to want, well, they will understand the small strategic steps that you want to do. Uh, but I think it's helpful for them to be able to see that within the context of the kind of, the broad direction and that you you have the understand you get what it is that you're about enough that you could encode all that in your mission statement. So the mission statement, in a, in a way, it outlines the role of the library. It says this is what the library is about. This is what the library does. These are the areas of responsibility for the library, but it's not the strategic plan for for furthering that mission statement. Right? So you kind of need both. Now, whether or not you share both of them to the senior management, you know, it really depends on the dynamics that you have in your organisation. I think the mission statement should be there. I think it should be in a really public place. Yeah, but you know, I always worry that, and it's happened to me so many times where you know there's been this urgent email saying, um, so there's been some rumblings over there. People saying, well, what's the library doing? You know. And they say, well, we have a mission statement. This is what we do. And they say, yeah, but what, what have you actually done about it? right? And we haven't got another thing that we can point to to say, this is what we've tracked. This is our strategy for the six months. This is our strategy for 12 months. This is how we constructed it. This is how it was fed, the information was fed to kind of produce that. And this is how we, we're aiming to deliver it. And we've got certain steps in, in place to do it. And I think those senior people will want both of those at different times. Yeah. Any more question, please? Thank you very much. Please stay here. <laughs>